Okay, so I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak at this uh, excellent event. Uh, let me start um, by saying uh, this is important, especially when you see the next slide, that I'm speaking today uh, as a researcher and as a concerned citizen and not as a representative of the Boston Fed or the Federal Reserve System. And when I say we, uh, I don't mean Janet uh, and me. And I had forgotten that the next, the first quote in this slide, this is from Janet from September of 2005 when she was a San Francisco Fed president. And um, uh, this uh, is to illustrate uh, what people in the system thought uh, about the possibility, uh, the, the connection between house prices and the financial system. And um, the effect of a bursting bubble could be large enough to feel like a good size bump in the road, but the economy would be likely to be able to absorb the shock. And then this Ben Bernanke's famous quote that the subprime, problems of the subprime market seem likely to be contained. Okay, so I'm, be, I'm mentioning them, um, but I actually um, said more or less the same thing myself. And so I wanna, uh, so I'm not, I'm not blaming them. And the title of this talk is uh, How Did Problems in a Small Part of the Mortgage Market uh, Disrupt the Entire Economy? And I gave a talk in uh, September of 2007 called Can Problems in a Small Part of the Mortgage Market Disrupt the Entire Economy? And of course, my answer was no. Uh, and, um, and I actually think it was a pretty good presentation. Um, uh, one of the things, <laughs> I, I mean, when I look back on it, I, I mean, I. You know, give, it, it, one of the things I said was, um, this is we actually went back to the forecasts from many crises, financial problems in the past, and we showed that forecasters have historically overestimated the impact of financial crises. There were some nice slides. Uh, and then I had this nice map and everything. Okay, anyway, what did it come down to? Uh, what we thought at the time was that we had this housing finance system which basically insulated the banks from the, the, the crash, the from falling house prices. So I had this nice map here. You've all seen this before, uh, you know, some version of this before. We had these high-rated MBS. We had low-rated MBS. All the risk was in the low-rated MBS. Um, and uh, the financing from that, it seemed sensible to think, was not coming uh, from banks. It was coming from people who could absorb losses. And um, so the whole idea of securitization, see, I say no banks necessary, uh, securitization was going to insulate the banking system from credit risk. So in September of 2007, when I gave this speech, we were already beginning to wonder a little about that. And um, what it turned out, of course, was that the intermediaries, so the banks, were riddled with subprime risk. And that was the thing that came as a real shock to everybody. We thought the whole point of this system, and it's ironic that to this day, there's this amateur theory that the crisis was caused because the intermediaries dumped all this risk on other people. If they dumped all this risk on other people, we never would have had a crisis. This table, this is the losses on mortgage-related securities. So Citigroup lost $42 billion. This is before, this is in June of 2008, where this table comes from. This is before Lehman. Okay, so what happened? Uh, so subprime, uh, which is where all these losses came, or a lot of these losses came from, was quite small. Um, there's been this, since it played such a big role, there's been this attempt to sort of say, oh, it was much bigger than we thought, but it wasn't. So this is the boom in mortgage debt starting right around 2000. Mortgage debt goes from, uh, so the ratio of mortgage debt to personal income goes up by 70%. Uh, subprime share uh, of outstanding mortgage debt, it didn't rise practically at all. It was small, it was around 8%, 7% in, 19, in 2000. And it was uh, on the eve of the crisis, it was still about 7%. Uh, it never rose that much. It was always small. And we actually have a new paper uh, where we go through, uh, using <laughs> big data, uh, we go through credit bureau data to show that the growth of debt was spread throughout the entire economy. Uh, high income debt for high income households grew at the same rate that it grew for low income households. But since uh, high income households had so much more debt to begin with, most of the new debt went to high-income households, and the result is the distribution of foreclosures was, it actually rose for the highest uh, income uh, households. And um, what does this tell you? So why does subprime, so losses went up everywhere across the board, so it's not to say there weren't huge losses on subprime mortgages, and it's not to say there wasn't huge growth in subprime debt, it was just proportional to the rest of the economy. And I think the way we interpret subprime now was 
that it wasn't the driver of the boom. In a sense, it was a way for low-income households to keep up with the high-income households who weren't using subprime. OK, so how did this infect the financial system? Well, I'm sure you've seen some version of this picture before, but there were the mortgage-backed securities over here. The bottom part, that's subprime. It's called home equity in the industry, but it's not home equity loans. This is subprime uh, first liens. Uh, and the way the deals work, they all had the senior subordinated structure. There were triple A rated bonds at the top, and then there were the triple B, the low rated bonds at the bottom. That's where the losses were absorbed. And what happened to those bonds? Well, that's what I, in my original slide, I thought, well, that's being held by hedge funds and so on and so forth. But we're actually where all those bonds will go, you I'll show in just a second, they were all going into these CDOs. And the logic, the, there was an impeccable logic for creating uh, subprime, uh, creating the mortgage-backed securities, which is if you know that 80, there's a 20% chance that the borrower is going to default on their mortgage, then if you have 10,000 mortgages, you can be sure that 8,000 of them are going to repay, and you can write AAA-rated bonds against them. And in fact, those worked out OK. Where things went wrong was when those bonds, the low-rated bonds, were then pooled uh, using similar logic, then pooled again into these CDOs. And that's where the AAA-rated stuff was. And that's the stuff that went on to banks' balance sheets. There's a paper by a colleague of mine uh, at the, um, uh, at the uh, Philadelphia Fed. Uh, and what they did was to go through and look uh, at where all these uh, AAA-rated bonds from the mortgage-backed securities ended up. And what's amazing is there were 5,500 uh, 5, BBB-rated bonds, but they went into, there were 37,000 of them in CDOs. And the miracle here was through this miracle of synthetic securities. So the 5,500 of them were the original ones. Those were cash bonds, which went into CDOs. But then they created another 30,000 copies of this. These were, uh, uh, in other words, they're synthetic securities. They're zero net supply securities. Uh, and those were the ones that accounted for most of the exposure in the CDOs. So basically what happened is, there were $64 billion worth of risk, which turned into $140 billion. So $64 billion worth of potential losses turned into $140 billion worth of, worth of losses in the CDOs. And that's what went on to the, um, uh, the balance sheet uh, of, the, um, uh, of the banks. OK, so what happened? I mean, it's important to understand that actually the subprime securities performed OK. It's hard to read this slide. You just have to trust me on this. In fact, there's no way you can read this slide. Uh, the bottom line in that, so I could tell you anything. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the bottom line in that slide is impairments of uh, AAA-rated securities backed by subprime mortgages. And the impairments were actually quite small. The bottom panel shows you the impairments of triple B rated securities, uh, AAA-rated securities in the CDOs. And you can see the impairments, almost all of them were impaired. Uh, the, uh, the point here is that the losses really came through the CDOs and not through the, um, not through the bonds backed uh, by mortgages. The bad news was the banks weren't holding the AAA-rated bonds backed by mortgages. They were holding the AAA-rated bonds backed by um, uh, CDOs. Okay, so uh, why did we not see this um, uh, coming? Uh, well. The, the CDOs, um, I remember this, uh, we said, well, CDO, that's debt, that's not mortgage. So we thought, and I, I, this is an explanation, it's not an excuse, uh, we thought that uh, the word D, and in fact, the president of the bank at the time, who was, said something about CDOs, were like, no, 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 the CDOs have nothing to do with this. Uh, well, that was wrong, so that was, uh, uh, really wrong. And, and what, what you can see from this picture, it's a little hard, what this picture shows, the blue area, the red area there, is the portion of the CDOs that was mortgage, um, that was backed by subprime mortgage uh, bonds. And you can see in 2000, it's around 20 percent. By 2007, the part that's directly backed by subprime mortgage uh, bonds in the CDOs is something close to 70 percent. And that turquoise area up there is uh, bonds in CDOs that came from other CDOs. Uh, so in fact, that's also subprime uh, risk. And so of that column there, almost everything is subprime. And I think one of the things we didn't realize 
was how this market had evolved from being a, originally AVS CDOs were kind of grab bag of different, you know, boat loans, car loans, uh, credit card receivables, and all kinds of stuff, to by 2007 being just a pure play uh, on, um, uh, on subprime. Okay, so let me go back to this uh, picture, and I'll come back to uh, the way we um, uh, think about this um, uh, now. What did we, uh, what did we learn, uh, you know, what did we get wrong in this picture? And the answer is that we didn't realize uh, how much of this exposure had gone onto, um, uh, onto bank balance sheets. And so to me, uh, and again, this is me and not uh, necessarily my colleagues in the system, I, my view is the most significant thing we've done since then is to do the stress tests. I'm not saying the stress tests are perfect. Uh, or even necessarily effective yet. Uh, but the purpose of them isn't so much, I don't, I'm not under any illusion that after you've passed the Federal Reserve stress test, you will definitely be able to survive the scenario we've described. What I think it does allow us to do is to, act, to, to look and see if what will happen to, to, to figure out that in fact these banks were riddled with exposure to subprime. And that's the kind of thing that I think we can do uh, with the stress test. Um, in a sense, it's an informational role. It's how we find out about the exposure uh, rather than necessarily believing that these banks are, are insulated from it. But as I said, I, I, I like to believe, I'm probably wrong, but that if we had been doing stress tests in 2006, we would have figured out uh, at least the somewhat uh, how exposed the financial system was to subprime. Okay, so I had one more slide in the new version of this. Uh, that I sent this morning, but I, I guess this is the version I sent last night. And so my last thing I'd like to say, uh, I always say this, and I thought, well, it's kind of a broken record, and maybe I'm done saying this, but I have to say it again, is I think what we, in other research we've done, uh, our view is that a lot of the decisions made by financial firms uh, to invest in subprime, uh, the mistakes, so some people have portrayed it, that there was institutional problems, that the uh, that because the banks weren't exposed to the risk, they'd made all these bad loans, but you can tell from this picture that can't be right, right? It can't be Citigroup lost $43 billion on CDOs, so the idea that Citigroup was somehow uh, duping people into buying CDOs uh, and, and you know, knowing that they were going to fail, uh, this picture suggests otherwise, or it certainly suggests that even if they had, you know, even if you forced them to hold some exposure, uh, it's not going to, $43 billion should be enough to get them not to do this. Okay, uh, what, is, what is our view about this? Our view is the reason that they made these decisions was because they were very optimistic about house prices. And nobody believed that house prices could fall. And so I think one thing that we overlook and that we have not studied uh, and that we don't have data on uh, and that we need data on is the expectations of, of market participants. And I think one of the things that would have been useful uh, at the time is if we had understood just how optimistic the assumptions that people made uh, when they did all these deals. And that's something that, um, uh, that all the data that we have right now does not really give us any uh, insight in. All right. So this is a slide you've all been 